Hey guys, what's up? It's Eric with Advanced Love Automotive. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another case study. Today, we're back here at the shop taking a look at another vehicle. This is a 2013 Infiniti G37. What they're telling me is that the vehicle is a crank, but no start. The backstory is that the lady was driving this car and while she was driving it, it died on her. Uh, she had it towed back to her house where they had a mobile mechanic come by and look at it. I think they said he replaced the fuel pump, the battery, the crankshaft position sensor but to no avail, the car still would not start. So she had it towed over to this shop where they've already done some preliminary checks. I know they told me that they tried to use some starter fluid, uh, but the engine still would not crank. So at that point, they really decided not to mess with it. They had a lot of other things going on here at the shop. And this type of stuff really for them, a lot of times is not worth putting the time into diagnosing uh, complicated stuff like this. So they called us out here to take a quick look at it. You guys already know how we do it. Let's get started. All right, so I'm gonna start by showing you guys what it's doing here. I have the key fob. I know this fob works because I can lock and unlock the door. And if you guys take a look, we do have a little security light that comes on in the instrument cluster. You'll see it flashing every three seconds or so. That's actually normal. That's just the car telling you that it is picking up the key. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to start the vehicle up. Got my foot on the brake. I'm gonna hit the start button. You guys can see the engine is cranking, but it does not start. Now, one of the first things I like to look for is going to be a check engine light. You guys take a look right down here. We do have a service engine soon light. The other thing I like to look for, and this is not always foolproof, but I like to see whether or not the tachometer needle jumps whenever the engine's cranking. So let's try that again. You guys can see it looks like the tachometer is actually moving. So that does indicate to us that we probably have a good crank signal getting to the engine computer. But already I can tell you there's something that I don't like. And that's the way the engine sounds when it's cranking. This is actually my first attempt at trying to crank this engine, so I have not heard it before. I'm just hearing this now, and quite honestly, it sounds to me like there's more of a mechanical issue going on here. And that's simply because the way the engine sounds when it's cranking, I'm listening for the rhythm, the cadence of the way the engine is cranking. Most every engine that has good compression on all cylinders is gonna have an even rhythm or an even cadence to the way the engine cranks. You should hear that same rhythm every time you crank it but as i crank this engine it sounds really uneven more like a so to me it definitely sounds like we have a cylinder with low compression i don't know if you guys were able to hear that but let me take you guys under the hood while i crank this engine and listen to it for yourself so hopefully you guys were able to hear that but this thing has a really uneven crank all right, guys, so let me show you my setup. Once again, we are worried about a compression issue. So what we're gonna do next is something called a relative compression test. You guys look over here. This is where the battery is located. And right here, I have my amp clamp connected to the battery cable that goes down to the starter motor. Also, you guys can see this yellow lead I have here. Well, that's going to the cylinder number one ignition coil. And what we're back probed on is the control wire that tells this ignition coil when to fire. So let me take you guys over to the lab scope. This is where I have my lab scope sitting up on top of the hood and the windshield. That way I can move inside the vehicle, crank the engine and they get my readings. But if you guys take a look here, we are on a one second time base. And once again, we have two channels. Our second channel, which is our green channel is going to be our amp clamp, which is going to measure our starter current and channel one, which is the yellow channel is going to be reading the ignition coil control circuit. So I'm gonna go ahead and crank it. One quick side note, this vehicle does have clear flood mode. So right now I have my foot on the accelerator all the way to the floor. And what that's going to do is it's going to deactivate the fuel. It's also going to hold our throttle bodies open so that we have maximum air intake coming into the engine while we're cranking it. So as you can see, I have two feet, one on the brake pedal, one on the accelerator pedal. I'm gonna go ahead and crank this thing. Then we're going to pause the lab scope. Now let's take a look at our capture. All right, so taking a look at our capture, you can see right here, this is our ignition coil firing event for our cylinder number one ignition coil. And if you take a look at the waveform here, you can see that we have several humps. But what you'll notice is that we do have several humps that have low compression. Once again, what we are reading here is the starter current. And what you have to understand is that every time the starter turns the engine over and it feels a compression stroke on a certain cylinder, the amperage is going to rise. If we had even compression across all of the cylinders, we're going to have even sized humps. But as you guys can see, obviously we have certain cylinders here that have low compression. Now, the interesting thing that I noticed here is that if you look through our entire cranking event, we only have one firing event from the ignition coil. 
I've actually seen this before because I am a Nissan tech. And what I can tell you right now is this generally happens when the computer can't figure out the timing sequence. So more than likely what we are dealing with here is a timing problem. All right guys, so before we can move on to the next step, which is doing a cam and crank correlation using the lab scope, we first need to know what a good waveform looks like. So if you take a look here at the computer, I'm on IATN and we have a known good waveform. You'll see that right here, this line is going to be our camshaft position sensor on bank one. And over here we have our camshaft position sensor on bank two. And then down here we have our crankshaft position sensor. If you take a look at this chart, it's giving us zero to 720 degrees of crank rotation. Because if you didn't know, on most engines, the camshafts only turn one time for every two turns of the crankshaft. So taking a look at the patterns, you can see that both of these are kind of reverse of each other. So if you look at this one, bank one, we have two pulses, and then we have one pulse and one pulse. You take a look at the other one down here, you can see we have one pulse, one pulse, then two and two, which essentially just looks like this one flipped over. So what we could expect to see on an engine that has good timing is that the first set of these two pulses on bank one are going to line up with the first one pulse of the bank two. And then also, if you look down here, both of these pulses here are going to line up with the start of these 10 pulses down here. So now that we know what we should be looking for, let's move back to the vehicle and check our timing. All right, so moving back under the hood, let me show you guys how I have my lab scope hooked up. So up here at the top, we have both of our cam sensors. Now what I'm actually gonna start by doing is a cam to cam correlation because we only have two channels on our lab scope which isn't really a problem but my main reason for doing it like this first is because the cam sensor on this vehicle is a lot more difficult to get to these cam sensors are right up here at the top now there are some small drawbacks to doing it this way because it is still possible that our timing chain may have skipped, but our two cams are still in sync with each other. They're just not in sync with the crankshaft. But on the other hand, it is also possible that when the timing chain skipped, one of these two camshafts is out of timing. And if that's the case, we're going to see it on the lab scope. So essentially what we're gonna do is start by doing the cam to cam correlation. And if we find that the two camshafts are out of timing, then we definitely know that our timing chain has skipped. But if we find that our capture shows that both of these are in sync with each other, then we have no choice but to connect one one of these channels down at the crank sensor. So once again, I've got my lab scope up here. I'm gonna move inside the vehicle and crank the engine. Let's pause this. Okay guys, so taking a look at our capture, our yellow line up here, our channel one, this is going to be our bank one. And then our green channel, which is our channel two, is going to be our bank two. So if you take a look at our pattern, again, up here at the top, we have our double pulses, one, two, one, two, and what we wanna see is that the first set of these double pulses match the single pulse down here on the bank two. But as you guys can clearly see, this pulse on the bank two is actually off just a little bit. It's not way off, but it's off probably a couple teeth or so, because if you guys remember from our known good waveform, this pulse here should line up exactly with this pulse here. All right guys, so at this point, we're pretty sure that we have a timing issue, but to be 100% sure, we are gonna go ahead and do a cam to crank correlation only because there is the possibility that we could have some variance in the cam timing due to this being a VVT style engine. So I already went ahead and connected my channel two lead down to the crank sensor, which is way down in there. Very difficult to get to, but I did manage to do it. Then over here on my channel one, which is the yellow lead, we're gonna be on the bank one cam sensor. So let me crank this engine over, then we'll take a look at our capture. All right guys, so I went ahead and I cranked the engine over. Here we have our capture. Look right here, this is our bank one cam sensor. And you can see our first set of double pulses, our second set of double pulses. But what you'll notice is that this first set right here is not lining up with the start of our 10 pulses on our crankshaft position sensor. This timing is way off. All right, guys, there we have it. We are 100% sure that this thing has a timing problem. Now, whether or not it's a bad tensioner or a bad chain, I mean, really the only way to know is to take the timing cover off, do a visual inspection and go from there. But I think at this point, the shop is probably just gonna go ahead and replace the engine. There's a lot of work that goes into doing the timing chain on this vehicle. And quite honestly, it is possible that we may have bent a valve from piston to valve contact. And if that's the case, that's really not worth it for them to try to go in there and repair it. It's easier to just replace it and move on to the next thing. Anyways, guys, at this point, I'm gonna end off the video. Like I always say, I hope you find it useful. I hope you find it informational, educational, entertaining. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks.